question because genre determines 99% of the stories that are told today in worldwide storytelling. It's that big. And genre is simply a type of story, but more specifically, it's a type of plot. And these are story forms, story variations that have been developed over hundreds and sometimes thousands of years. And they've been proven to be successful. That's why I always call genres, especially the 14 genres that determine storytelling today, I call them the all-stars of the story world because they have been proven to be successful with readers and viewers. And the reason for that primarily is that each genre has anywhere from 15 to 20 major plot beats that must be in that form if the writer is going to be telling the story properly. And they come in a certain sequence. And this sequence has been worked out over a long period of time. And this is why the story be Come so successful because writers know that this is a very, this is a popular way of receiving drama that appeals to them. What they usually don't know is that genres aren't just a plot system. They're also a theme system. It is, a, it is each genre expresses a deeper life philosophy for how to live. And that is expressed through the plot beats. This is how you express theme without being on the nose, without being preaching, preachy to the audience. And so it is this deeper theme, it's this deeper life philosophy that is so appealing to people who come back to that genre again and again. They're not even aware of it. And yet that's what, because it, because each one of these genres is expressing a set of values by which someone can live their life. And the values that people, the, the values of the genre that people come back to again and again are values that they share and they want to use as the model for how to live. So I always tell writers, you know, the, 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 the biggest thing that writers try to avoid is theme. They think, oh, I don't, I don't want to preach to the audience and rightly so. But if you don't use theme, and especially the theme that is embedded in that genre, you are hitting maybe one-tenth of the power of your writing. Okay. And there are, I think, you know, we're going to be talking about horror today. And I think whether it's horror or it's any other genre, there are certain tropes that people come to expect and are conditioned to expect from having seen a ton of horror movies or read a bunch of horror fiction. And I think what you're talking about when it comes to theme gets to this next point, which has to do with structure. It's not enough, you argue in your book, to simply play on the tropes of a genre well. You have to do more than that in order for the story to be effective. Well, and this word trope is a very deadly term. It's the term that everybody throws around. And they, and you're absolutely right, there are these different tropes in each one of the genres. The problem with the concept of trope is that it is an individual story beat. And the big mistake that so many writers make when they're writing genre stories is they think, I'll just grab a few tropes, some from my genre, maybe some from others, put them together, and I've got a great story. Absolutely wrong. Because the difference between trope and genre is that trope is an individual story beat genre is a sequence of story beats. It is the sequence of the story beats that works on the audience. In any An individual trope does virtually nothing. And so if you don't know what that sequence is, and why is that sequence so important? It's because the sequence sets up a set of expectations for the plot. And then this is what allows us to then move beyond just the basic way that everybody else is telling that genre, because what you do is you transcend the genre. And one of the main ways you transcend a genre is you flip the sequence. You change the sequence so the audience's expectation, which is built up over having watched thousands of these stories, 
you suddenly break it. And they go, whoa, I'm getting my genre beats that I love, but you're doing it in a way I've never seen before. And that's really pleasing. Mm. And you say too, I mean, there's a funny, kind of funny passage in the book where you talk about yourself before Star Wars and after Star Wars yeah. and how today popular stories tend to combine genres, correct? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, I, I talk in the opening chapter about the, the three rules of modern storytelling today. The first one is it's a genre world, which we've just discussed. The second one is that to be successful, to be popular, you need to mix anywhere from two to four genres. And this gets to the fundamental thing that has been happening in storytelling for the last 20 years in every medium, which is it's become more plot dense. And why is that? Because the, the marketing guys have realized that we need to give them two for the price of one. And now that's not enough, three or even four for the price of one. And why is genre so key for doing that? It's because if each genre has 15 to 20 major plot beats and you mix two or three, you're going from say 15 to 45 plot beats in this same two hour film. Or in the same 300 page, 300 page novel. That is much more appealing to the audience. And what I have found, especially over the last five years, is, and this, this fact, this reveal just amazed me, which is that what separates the top 1% of writers from everybody else is the ability to express complex plot. Most people don't know how to do it. They, 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 they think they understand character. They think they know what, a, what good dialogue is. When it comes to plot, they think, well, I'll just figure it out as, as I go. Well, guess what? That never happens. And that's one reason why genres are so powerful, because you've got those plot beats already worked out. So then when you mix them, you get this very dense plot, and then you run into the next danger that you've got to watch out for, which is you can't just mix the genres just any, any way that you feel like doing it because you get story chaos. It's actually a lot trickier than it appears. And that's why I talk about in the book that, well, yes, you want to mix two to four genres. You need to know how to do it. And the first rule for doing that is pick one of those genres to be the primary form that establishes your baseline. That's the spine of the story. That's the beats that you have to hit that tells you your main hero, your main opponent, and all of the thematic elements that must be in that story. You then take the other genres and the other genre beats and mix them and blend them in only when they support the main line. If you do that, if you follow that process, you'll be very successful. Hmm. So let's let's then get into horror as our primary example today and how it is, as you argue, intrinsically tied to religion and to fear of death, like in terms of its origins and the way that it works on people primally. Yeah, it's one of the... the most fascinating things to me in writing my book, The Anatomy of Genres, was to find out what these genres appear to be about and then what they're really about. And it's often quite different than what you would think. So, for example, horror is all about the scare. It's all about, you know, it's it's frightening. It's It's terrifying when we're in there. We're in this kind of pressure cooker and it's very exciting. It's very sensational. And that's great. That's, that's how it carries its message. But what it's really about is facing death. The fact that we are all going to die and there is no way out. And this is why the, what, what the horror form does is much deeper than we think it is. Horror is probably the most disdained of all the genres. It's the most looked down on. And 
for, for many years, it's then not so much the case now, but for many years, genre writing itself was looked down on. Oh, there's serious fiction and then there's genre writing. Well, <laughs> we've gone past that a long time ago, but we still got that sense about horror. And the reason for it is, is because horror when done at its base level is very low level storytelling. It's basically monster attacks victim ad infinitum until the very end when we think the story's over and he attacks the victim one more time, right? <laughs> right okay. Right. Now that's, there's not much plot there, right? That's that, you know, as, as you I'm sure know, it, it's a perfect example of one of the great plot sins, which is hitting the same beat. So the question for for horror writers is, how do we take this form to its deepest and highest level? And that's where transcending horror becomes so important. So we're not just getting the basic slasher film. We're not just hitting this same beat. And that's where understanding that horror is really about, not about the attack from the outside, from the monster. That deeper attack is from inside. Hmm. Horror is really about the flaws of the human mind. And it's, I find it very interesting and, and very illuminating to go back to the origin of modern horror, the, the origin of the modern psychological horror story is Edgar Allan Poe. And Edgar Allan Poe is a massively important uh, figure in the history of story, because he not only invented modern horror, he invented the detective form. And to, just to do one of those is amazing. He did both. And in many ways, they are total opposites. You know, horror is the most primal form. Detective is the most intellectual form. And yet, when you look at them on a deeper level, what are they really about? You realize it makes total sense that Poe would be able to do both because the detective story is about the mind at its best and the horror story is about the mind at its worst. And so when we have this attack from the monster in better horror stories, that monster is an expression of the hero's greatest fear and flaw. And it is then personified, and then it turns around and attacks that person relentlessly. And what we're really looking for is, will the mind break? Under that pressure, and horror is all about pressure. You know, there, there's an old saying in, in real estate, you know, the three things that determine the value of a property, right? Location, location, location. Three things determine the value of a horror story, pressure, pressure, pressure. You put it on, you don't let it up. You may let it up slightly only to put even more pressure on afterwards. And so this, but it's, but it's all about testing the mind to its greatest degree. And one of the things I talk about in horror and in all the genres, all the genres hit the basic steps of great storytelling. But certain genres hit certain steps harder than others. And horror, to really understand, you have to know what it's really emphasizing of the key story structure steps. It emphasizes two of them, the ghost and the opponent. Ghost is a term that I use that refers to the event in the past that is haunting the hero in the present. And any good story in any genre has that. But in horror, this ghost is the most important step of all because the hero is, uh, is dealing with already from, the, from page one in the story with this tremendous ghost, this tremendous haunting that they are experiencing from a, from a wound that has already happened. And typically, this ghost has to do with the sins of the fathers and the mothers where they committed a crime that has never been paid for. And so it is going to attack 
again and again and again for every generation until it is paid for. So, but what does that mean in structured terms? The ghost is the internal opponent for the character. And it is what causes the mind to be on edge, to be ready to break. Then we get the external opponent, which is the monster. And as I just mentioned, in good horror stories, that monster is the hero's fear, their ghost, their weakness, turned into an external character who can then attack them. So that's why horror puts more pressure on the hero than any other form by far. Mm. So when the t when you talk about beats, I mean, you just touched on the first beat that you go over, uh, you know, for a horror, a good horror story, and that is the ghost, this, these sins of the past, this internal struggle. A question that I have has to do with like the beats in their totality, just so that I'm clear. A horror story well told will touch on all of the beats that you describe yes, at some point. Yes, it will. Does the sequencing matter? It does matter. Um, it's, it, it's, a, it's a great question, and there's, there's two very important parts to the answer. It matters a lot. Why do the beats in that sequence matter so much? It's because over time, writers found that that was the most dramatic way to express the story problem that that genre raises. So, for example, the, the beats in a love story raise, are, are used to dramatize what it means for two human beings to fall in love. How does it happen? What is the obstacle to it? What is the success of it? Same is true for horror. Horror, those are the beats that dramatize the difficulty of the flawed mind to try to heal itself. And horror, of course, does this ne negatively. It is a cautionary tale because it almost always fails. And so, but this is the reason that this sequence is the way it is, is because it is a sequence of building pressure until finally the mind cracks. And so on, that's why I said, said that using that first rule of storytelling, you've got, it's a genre world, you've got to hit the 15 to 20 beats of that form and in that order. But you also then have to, how do you stand apart from the crowd? That's, that's, that's part two, which is you can't just hit the beats that everybody else in your form is hitting because then you will have a generic genre story and you won't stand above the crowd. So how do you do it in a way that's never been done before? One of the ways you do it, and it goes back to transcending the form, is you play with the sequence. Another way that you do it, so you don't, you don't change it so much that it's non-dramatic. You still have to see why, you still have to keep building that pressure. But you do it in such a way that the sequence of how we're going to work through it is different than I usually expect. Second way you do it is how you execute each of those individual beats. So you might do the you know, the past crime that the, that the character is dealing with in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, the, but the, then there's the second way that you transcend, which is where you dig into the deep theme of the genre form, of the horror form, and you express that and you find ways to express that. Good example, recent example of this is her, Hereditary where you get, you're, you're getting, you're looking at the mind. This is, these are people dealing with grief and we're showing how this deep grief cracks the mind. And, but we're doing it and it, we're doing it in a way that is extremely personal, that gets to the deepest, some of the deepest potential of the horror form, which is to show, you know, what other form is so good at showing how the mind does not work. We always think of the human mind as this magnificent, you know, thing. It's the most, probably the most magnificent creation in the world. And it is, but it's also filled with flaws. 
And this is something that we then extend to the entire human race when we combine the horror genre with science fiction, which is one of the things that I, one of the two major forms that I talk about in the transcending section of the horror chapter. But that's taking the flaws of the mind and saying the entire human race is so flawed that it may well destroy itself if we don't fix it in time. So just to touch upon that first beat that you talked about a moment ago, the ghost, and to make sure that uh, our listeners are on, you know, along for the ride here, this is not necessarily an indication that you're talking about a ghost story correct in the kind of classic sense the ghost can be like you said the sins of fathers and mothers that yes. are way in the past which the hero or the heroine now has to pay for it can also be an internal flaw or conflict or uh, it's typically the, the cause of the internal flaw because the next major beat that you get after ghost is the weakness of the character. It's the great flaw of the character. Again, this is present in all genres, but the, the ghost is typically, and that, that original crime is typically the cause for the weakness, which is that the mind is on the edge of breaking. Okay. And so for, for example, if you look at a classic uh, story like psycho here, the flaw is that, that, um, Anthony Perkins character, I can't remember his, his, his name in the, the story, but, but he has killed his mother because Norman, Norman, thank you. Yes. <laughs> He's, Norman has killed his mother. And because out of jealousy, out of rage that she was with a man and out of that then was followed by tremendous guilt. So he creates this, you know, he, he puts the, the, uh, you know, the skeleton down in the basement, you know, classic use of the basement that we get in horror stories. Um, this is, that is the past crime creating the crack in the mind. And the, I talked in the, in these early beats about the, this crack is a dual duality of the mind. And with Norman is a perfect example. He's, with most people, most of the time, he's a very kind, gentle, decent person. But when he goes to the other side, then we get he is a murderer and he is a serial killer. So this is this is in the same unit. It's in the same mind. But and then you get, you know, Dr. Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde, another example of this division within the same mind. Hmm. So the next beat that you talk about is story world. And uh, you refer to it as the haunted house or the closed society. This is another beat that good horror stories hit. Typically, yes. Every story and every story form has a unique story world. This is the context within which the character lives. And a good story world, if you if you know what you're doing as a writer, will help to create the character, and it will certainly have tremendous influence and effect on that character. So, in the horror story, it is typically some version of a haunted house. And you recall when I said earlier that the monster in better horror is the hero's great fear turned into a person who then attacks him. Haunted house is the hero's great fear turned into a building in which we force him to live so that he is under now under attack, not just from a monster. He's under attack from the world, the world and the building that he lives inside. Well, and you know what? I'm, what I'm all... sorry to interrupt, but you know what I'm thinking of as, as you say that is uh, and it's one of the movies you draw on as an example is Ex Machina. Yes where the, the setting is so great. You know, you're yeah. in the middle of absolutely nowhere. You got to take a helicopter to get there. You're <laughs> stuck there and you're living with these, what, you know, androids. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it, one of the great, you know, transcendent horror stories in the last few years, love that movie. And, and again, an example of, it's not just a single genre. 
there you're mixing with science fiction and it's a great, I mean, this, this writer is terrific. Um, but, but yeah, this, this story world, this is one of the main ways that we put pressure on the hero and then are able to increase the pressure. And it uses a technique that I call the pressure cooker effect, where we put the character within a locked area and we then build the conflict inside it until it gets so extreme, the pressure is so extreme that the whole thing blows up. And that's eventually happens at the final battle at the very end of the story. So that's, also, that's why that limited world is so important for creating the effect of horror. Now that, that same writer, Alex Garland from Ex Machina also did another transcendent horror story, great story, 28 days later, where he was able to expand it. And this is very rare he was able to expand the horror how the 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 haunted house to the haunted city um and was still able to create these pressure cooker effect um again it's just an example of how good this guy is yeah he's wonderful he did the beach too that novel he's got a very keen sense of genre yeah and and blending genres uh, you also, I believe, in the in the haunted house and closed society beat, talk about like this dichotomy between the cellar and the attic. Yeah, uh, can you just talk a little bit about that in terms of how it affects? This is a, this is a, this, this is a, something I talk about extensively in my first book, my previous book, The Anatomy of Story, because it is an important distinction in the story world in any genre. Uh, the cellar is where the the ghost the crimes of the past are buried and this is also again because we're always making a connection between the world and the mind of the character in horror this is literally the case that we have as we we have with norman where we have the skeleton of the crime that is in the basement um, but it's also the skeleton of the mind. It's, uh, excuse me, the basement of the mind itself. This is the, the primal place of the mind. This is the reptilian part of the mind, the base mind that gets to the gr great fears and, and unsociable desires that horror stories are based on. These things like rape, killing, um, being buried alive, um, various ways that uh, the greatest fears that we have as living human beings. Um, and so th this and, and the greatest desires that we have that are taboo that we cannot face. This is what Norman can't face, that that he had desire for his mother and that he then killed his mother matricide that you can't do that you know this is just this is just unspoken cannot be done so that's why that's why the skeleton excuse me the basement is so crucial in story because it is what it is the physical expression of that part of the mind the attic is typically shown in a much more positive light in storytelling it sh it's it shows past memories that we've forgotten, but were in many cases utopian moments, the the best moments of our lives. They've been hidden away in the attic, and we often have in stories where somebody goes back to the attic and discovers this is something that I've hidden away or that I've forgotten, and it's an important part of who I am that I have to bring out now. It can, the attic can also be a very negative place like the basement. And we get things like Jane Eyre and many stories, especially in English storytelling, where we've got the, the spouse and in fairy tale, where we get the spouse or the ex or something like that, um, or, or just simply a family member who is mad, who has gone mad. And they are, because the attic is the top of the mind. And so 
we we've put them up we've we've locked it's the locked door that you're not supposed to go go beyond because that's again they've gone to the other side and we're not supposed to go there okay and so uh just to be clear when it comes to integrating the seller and the attic into your horror story it's not an explicit declaration i think what you said earlier is that you have to somehow indicate for example the dark the dark past that's down in the cellar or the the taboo thinking or desire or whatever it is you have to indicate that through character action it's not like the character sits there and just kind of talks it out and tells you you know obviously that wouldn't work uh, exactly. so it's just it, it, at the level of execution it's like how do we integrate these things into a horror story you do it through scene you do it through dialogue you do it through physical action yes Yes. And, and you do it through in those particular cases, it is the discovery, the act of someone, because that door to the basement or the door to the attic is a door we don't want to open. And the a door that that main character has not opened. And at some point, though, because of the sequence of actions that they are taking, that the monster is taking against them, they have to go down there. They have to open that door. And when they go down there, they will discover some very horrific things, either that someone else has done in the past or that they have done that they've tried to hide. Okay. But you're absolutely right. It is done, always done through action. And keep in mind, you don't have to have a basement in your horror story. You don't have to have an attic. Um, these are just parts of the entire story world, the haunted house that you can use. And it's just having a sense that they have deeper meaning if you want to give it to that area. You don't have to use it, but it's there for you. Well, what, I mean, what we're touching on is something that you repeatedly say throughout this book and in this chapter in particular, that for horror stories to become transcendent, they tend to become internal and deeply human and very character concerned. You know, it's not just about the, the horrible monster or the special effects or hitting those tropes. It's when you create a real dimensional hero or heroine who's dealing with real relatable human challenges. Right. And, and th this is the, the key to transcending right there is what you do with the main character. And I talk in the, in the second half of the chapter in the, in the anatomy of genres book, um, the first half of every chapter, I go through the 15 to 20 plot beats in sequence that you have to be able to hit in order to tell that story properly. The second half of each chapter, I go through in detail. It's about 25 pages. It's a long book, about 25 pages in each chapter. I go through the thematic elements. And what is theme? Theme is really how the main character goes through character change or fails to go through character change over the course of the story. By in going through and being forced to go through these plot beats, what is the character change that they are pressured into making? And so this it, that's why the key to transcending horror is don't just have the character be a victim. The, the main character in horror is typically the lowest character you can have, which is a victim. You don't want to do that. You want to give them some agency. You want to give, but you want to give them, this is a person who is dealing with severe mental problems. And then the question is, how do they handle it? Now, yes, it is negative. And this is one of the few forms where the character does not go through character change. Not that the writer forgot to do it. It's that it is a, as I said, it's a cautionary tale. It's they were unable to make that change. And, but this is why things like stories like Get Out, one of the best transcendent horror stories in many years, was so great, was because 
they gave the characters some agency and there it wasn't it didn't end in total defeat and in horror the typical ending isn't just one defeat it's a second defeat that is an is an eternal recurrence in other words we know as the audience this is going to happen forever this is never going to get solved so the problem is that's a very depressing ending that is a very depressing form in terms of what is the ability of a human being to get better and to grow in some way? But, and, and this is one reason why the, the transcendent horror is either combined with myth, which is the religion story, or it is combined with science fiction, which then takes our attention from the individual in the story to human beings as an entire race of beings and can we solve the problem of what it means to be human in time? Hmm. It's well, very challenging to transcend the horror form. Let me put it that way. Well, we can't talk about horror without talking about the monster attacking. I mean, you have to have that, right? If you don't have that, you don't have horror. The monster yep. is the monster attacks is another, is the next beat, uh, you know, that you talk about yep. and it is the driver of the action. It is. And, and this is one of the difficulties that writers of horror have because we are taught that the hero of the story drives the action. And in almost all genres, the hero does, but not in horror. <laughs> and so this creates the problem that the writer, one of the central problems that writers have in horror, which is if the, if the opponent is driving the action, it means a lot of things. One of them is it means you've got a victim hero, you've got a passive hero, a reactive hero, and it means that their desire line, the desire line is the beat after I mentioned we have ghost, we have weakness, need, then we have desire. These are the major early steps, structure steps. The desire is escape. This is the lowest desire line you can get in a story. And so all of these make for a very, this, these are the, I've just mentioned the structural reasons why the horror story tends to hit the same beat Why and why it has if you don't know what you're doing, you end up with a short story. That's all you got. So these are all things that make it very difficult to write. And, but this is why I also say in, in the book, I talk about the fact that one of the keys, one of the key techniques for raising your horror story up and giving it more plot is to make the opponent, not just this killing machine, but very intelligent and use it. And that means the use of deception. And what that does is not only does it make the plot beats more interesting because we don't know what's going to happen. It's not just, Oh, he's going to come out of a different door with the same knife and stab me again. No, it means that how he's going to attack is going to change and preferably in very surprising ways. That also means because the hero is one of the key t techniques of all story, heroes, hero is only as good as the person he fights. In other words, as the, the better the opponent, the better the hero has to be to beat him. And so when you give the, make the opponent very deceptive and intelligent in the way they attack, it's going to force the hero to say, okay, well, what am I going to do about this? I'm going to have to come up with a better plan than just try to escape, try to run as fast as I can to beat this guy. And so all of a sudden we're raising the plot from both sides because plot comes from the relationship between hero and opponent. So this is one of the keys to building the plot. Um, now, you know, the, the, a lot of the pleasure that, that viewers get in watching horror is to see the different ways that these attacks are made. And I talk in the, in the book about 
different kinds of attacks. One is the false attack. And this is, you know, this is foundational to horror stories, right? It's, it's because we're trying to create pressure. So how do we do it? Every time there is an attack, that's pressure. So, but the audience knows that that attack is going to come. So as they're getting worried, we get what appears to be an attack. And then the audience and the hero go, oh, thank God. Uh, that wasn't really an attack. They let their guard down. Now the real attack hits, right. and now we're not prepared for it. It's much <laughs> more powerful. There's all kinds of, I talk about these different ways of attack is the, the foreplay of the horror story. It's, it's, it's how you get, because what we're finally going to get down to is the final battle, the final challenge where the hero is either going to kill the, the monster or the monster is going to kill the hero. Well, I think of, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm like, with, yeah. as you say this, I have a great illustration. It's that I'm thinking of the first Scream movie where Drew Barrymore is, thinks that there's an intruder in the house or she hears something. And then I think the phone rings, the phone ringing is often oh, yeah. the false attack or the cat jumping yeah. out, you know, it's like yes. always like a pet or something. And that's a, that happens. I mean, it's rec instantly recognizable to anybody yes. who's seen like five horror movies that yes. that's absolutely right. Absolutely. And, and what's funny about it is that even though as, as people who have seen many horror stories, we know that it's good, there's going to be fake attacks and so on. It still surprises. Us. It still catches us because again, it's, it's been, these techniques have been worked out for a long time and in the hands of really good writers and, and, and directors, um, they're going to get you. And especially because once they put you in that haunted house, when you're in that pressure cooker, the sensuality of it is so intense, you cannot intellectualize your way out of it. It's going to get to you, you know? And I mean, it's it, one of the great reveals to me in writing this book was just how great this form is. And people look down on it. It is a fabulous form with tremendous with tremendous thematic power if you will only explore that area well but the interesting thing is that it might be looked down upon it's also hugely popular yes you know so it's like both at the same time i guess and i'm i'm wondering as uh, a, a bookish person if there are any differences or exceptions or anything along those lines when it comes to writing for the screen versus writing for the, the page and literature, like do the genre principles that you um, lay out in this book hold up in either se in either case? Totally the same. Totally. Now, the same. This is not to say that there aren't differences between film and novel, but the basic, and, and this is one of the reasons why my, my first book, the anatomy of story is called the anatomy of story, not the anatomy of the screenplay is because the techniques that I talk about, the principles that I talk about, apply to every medium. Now, there are every medium has its differences. For example, novel and television increase the amount of plot that you get within the same period. Um, and, but but the, the techniques that you use to get plot are the same. And so the, the, the techniques that I talk about in the horror chapter apply absolutely to whether you're writing a screenplay or whether you're writing a novel. Okay. So just to quickly review, we've talked about the ghost as a story beat. We've talked about building the story world, the haunted house that you're putting your reader in or your viewer in. We've talked about the monster attacking as another beat that horror stories always obviously deliver. You touched upon and talked about another beat without naming it explicitly, which is the, the hero as victim, which yeah. is unique to the horror genre. Correct? There's no other, I can't think of another genre where that's the oh, case. That's it. So your hero is uniquely victimized and uniquely passive and subject to the whims of the monster, essentially. Yeah. And then this next beat that I want to talk about is something that you describe as weakness need number one, slavery of mind and the monster within. So what does that mean? <laughs> the slavery of the mind is the, the, the person, because the mind is on the verge of breaking, the, the, the person is imprisoned in their own head. And 
unless they can figure out a way to which they are going to, this prison is so horrific that they are creating outside characters that are attacking them. And that that's why the, you know, I talked in that very point that you just made, which is the duality of the mind. It is, it is, it's not that, that they are insane and they are, you know, they're, they're sitting in an asylum and they are completely unable to think consciously or rationally at all. No, they're both. And it's this, it's the fact that they have these two compartments and the Poe used this all the time where you have, you know, and he even applied it to the haunted house with the, the crack down the middle of the house, follow the house of Usher. It's that the mind is both rational and irrational. And the, the struggle, the slavery that they're dealing with is I'm trying to prevent myself from going all the way over into the irrational. And, the, and it is essentially a struggle that they will fail. And, and partly this is because it gets to the larger issue of what the horror story is about, which is it's the monster isn't just their own internal fears that are turned into a character. The monster that they're fighting, the ultimate goal that they have is to defeat death. And this they will fail at. Um, and where you get and you get in different kinds of of horror stories like like uh, um, Dracula's story, where what they're trying to do is what you see are examples of a character who has tried to defeat death by postponing it. So living dead, you know, these are people who are, they are alive, but they are, they have been turned into machines. They have, there's no personal identity to them. Um, and, and again, that is in the mind. So, and, and this is the, I talk in the book about there's, there's two major kinds of horror where, where the character gets reduced. And this is the, the great fear that they have. One is animal horror. That's the fear of losing control and especially fear of sexual passion. The other kind, more modern kind of horror that we see is the, is machine horror. And that is the fear of losing personal identity, your individuality. And any zombie story is an example of that. So, but again, that's in the mind. And so the, the big problem that, that the person faces is they try to make a deal with death. And if they're, if they're a Dracula character, they make a deal with death, but the cost is massive. I'll let you live longer, you know, 300, 400 years, but you, to really stay alive, you have to kill human beings. You have to kill people. You have to, your, in other words, your moral quality has, is, is as low as it can possibly be. Um, in, you know, uh, Stephen King and something like Pet Cemetery. cat dies. Oh, we like this cat. Well, I hear there's this, there's this burial ground where you can, you can go and it'll bring back, it'll bring back the dead. So he brings back the cat, but the cat's mean now, right? And then, and then the, the little child dies. <laughs> like, I can't, I can't handle that. I can't handle the death of a child. So I'm going to bring him back. And now that child is no longer the child he knew. It, this is a nasty, mean child. And so the cost of trying to defeat death, which cannot be defeated, is that we will create more death. We can only lose in a big way. And this is, this is where the, the power of horror really comes in. Because what horror is telling us thematically is you have to confront your death and use it positively. Meaning, use the realization that you aren't gonna live forever to make choices in your life right now. And the first thing you want to do is make amends for the sins that you have committed in your life. And this is, so basically what we're saying is 
not only are you going to use death in a positive way to change who you are going forward and what you do going forward, you're going to make moral amends. You are going to, you are going to change the morality of who you are. And that is a very powerful thing. And that's why it is horror is the first genre I talk about. It is the most primal thing. It's because the themes and the life philosophies of all other genres depend on that idea right there. Face the fact that you will die and use it to change who you will be going forward. Okay. And along with that, when we talk about the relationship between the hero and the monster and the, the deepest thematic stakes of horror, something that you've touched upon a little bit already in this conversation and something that you talk about in your book has to do with the ways in which the monster in a horror story reflects the inner monster of the hero. Like there is a deep relationship between those two things in a horror story well told, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's really found in the first great transcendent horror story, which is Frankenstein. To this day, there's nothing to compare to it. Mary Shelley was, again, a massive figure in, in the history of story because she made possible not just horror, uh, but also the entire speculative fiction family, which is, you know, includes science fiction. So, so this person who was doing this little parlor game about let's come up with the best ghost story um, was what made huge changes in how stories are told. And in Frankenstein, you get the single most important technique for transcending the horror story, which is exactly what you were just referring to, which is that over the course of the story, we make a structural flip between the hero and the opponent. The character that we began with as the hero becomes the opponent. The character who we started off with as the monster, the terrifying, horrifying thing that we don't want to even look at, turns out they're the true hero. This flip makes the transcendent story possible, and every transcendent horror story since then has used that technique. That's how huge it is. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The, there's a weird, like almost perverse joy that horror audiences and horror readers get rooting for the monster in a weird way. Both, res, you know, both wanting the hero to escape, but also in a like I think again of Ex Machina. You're sort of rooting for the android woman totally to do totally. her thing and to escape you know so. that is a great example of what i'm just what i was just talking about that is that is the transcendent horror structural flip that we're talking about you absolutely are you know she's basically in a in a cage in a glass cage we're using her doing an experiment on her and and you know can we can i fool you into the whether she's human or not you know and and I love the irony of it is that the way we we end up finding out that she's human is not that we see that she has the ability to love, is that the ability that she has to fake love and commit murder in order to get free. <laughs> right. I mean, it, 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 that, that movie is just brilliant, just brilliant on every level. And anybody who wants to see how to not only write a transcendent horror story, but to combine it with science fiction, take a look at that film. Yeah, I I admire it too. Just that, like, there are some business aspects to that film. You know, they always like one of the reasons why horror films get made so often is that they tend to be cost effective. At least yeah. as far as I understand, they have like a single location. Yeah. So you're not changing sets a lot. You know, it's just everybody's kind of marooned in like the cabin in the woods, or yeah. this, and, and this is a cabin in the woods. Essentially, it's a very you know, it's a very high end cabin, <laughs> right. but it performs that function and. uh it's just a, it's a great, great film. So I want to get to another beat, which uh, again, you've kind of, you kind of already touched on it, but it's worth pointing out is that shame and guilt are such a huge part of horror stories. The hero of a horror story is almost always wrestling with these emotions. 
Well, it's important under, and shame and guilt is important in the entire book. I talk about them in a number of different chapters. Uh, and I talk about, for example, in science fiction, I talk about shame culture versus guilt culture. In other words, these are these are these basic emotions expanded out to an entire cultural, an entire way of living for a society. I mean, they're massive concepts. They're extremely important for understanding how story works and how human beings work. But they're especially important in horror because I mentioned that the mind in horror is ready to crack. It's right on the verge. And so, and we, we create this monster who then attacks us. Well, shame and guilt are the way human beings attack themselves for their actions or more exactly their failure of action. And shame is how we attack ourselves for failure in the eyes of others. It's very public. It's very public. I didn't reach a standard in my actions. Everybody saw it, and now I feel shame. I feel embarrassed about that. Guilt is more private. Guilt is usually some version of, I failed in my responsibility towards someone I love. And I feel guilty about that. And, but, 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 the important thing to realize is that despite their differences, they're both examples of the mind attacking itself, usually in a way that you cannot succeed. You know, you, you can, I should have done this. Well, maybe you should have, but you didn't, you mm -hmm. know, and, and we're all, we all make mistakes. So, you know, and yet with shame and guilt, we will, we will continue the failure. We attack again and again and again. And this is why this shame and guilt are very important in horror because they're the main tools for how the mind, which is already on the verge, pushes itself over. You ever seen the film Drag Me to Hell? <laughs> no, I have not. <laughs> oh, well, that's a grabbing that I'm thinking of shame and guilt. It's a great, it's a great like 80 minute horror movie it's it's mm. short you know it's very compact and simple but you know i won't i won't regurgitate the plot here for our listeners but it's a good one if you're thinking about shame and guilt as a story beat because it's so central to that one right and i want to talk about defeat of the monster which is another key beat in a horror story like we have to see that huge confrontation you know you're building there are usually multiple confrontations between hero and monster but it's yeah. Like you say, it's that it's that pressure cooker and it's that uh, pressure, pressure, pressure all the way up until we get to the ultimate battle. Yeah. And hopefully the monster is defeated, though not always. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, usually they are not. But one of the I think one of the keys to popular horror, the most popular horror stories um, I, I, I don't know that I want to go far enough to say that the more, you know, if you do have eventually, def you, if the hero eventually defeats the monster, it's more popular because you have things like Carrie where they don't and they are incredibly popular. Again, it's the main beat in horror is that you will not defeat the monster. And in fact, not only will you lose to the monster, you will lose again and again and again. It, the attack will never, never end. Why? Because the original source of the story, the crimes of the, the, the sins of the fathers and the mothers, which weren't paid for then, still have not been paid for. And if the hero didn't pay those, those, for those sins during the story, they're going to, they're going to lose and they're going to keep losing. But you get something like Alien, which is almost literally the pressure cooker effect in this movie where they're on this spaceship. They've got, they got nowhere to go, right? And so, and you, you get this in, in fantastic monster that, you know, grows in that this, one of the all-time great horror scenes where, you know, they're, they're looking at the eggs and, and the, the, the thing clamps onto the guy's helmet on his <laughs> right. face, you know, I mean, how, how primal is that? You know, that they have this monster right on the guy's face. And of course, then it comes out of his chest and so on and so forth. But if you look at, to see how great horror is done at the, at the battle, 
look at the battle scene, the final battle scene in Ailey, because there you get one of the, another one of the techniques I talk about, which is the cyclone effect. Uh, cyclone effect is used in many different genres, but in horror, it means that we have a sequence of nightmare reveals. Nightmare reveals that come at a faster and faster pace as we get to the end of the story. And there you have not only the attack by the monster at its most intense form, biggest conflict of the story, but you have, it's broken into a sequence of nightmare reveals that the hero has and that the audience has about how that opponent is attacking. So we get, you know, the, the, the destruct button. She tries to turn it off. It's too late. That's nightmare reveal number one. Okay, so I'm going to jump in the pot, right? That's my safe haven. That's where I'm going to escape to. That's going to get me out of here, right? We calm down. Audience, calm down. Oh, thank God I made it. Okay. And she discovers the monster is already on the pod. <laughs> you know, oh my God. You know, and it's even smaller space. So we're intensifying the pressure cooker. And again, it's the reverse expectation of what we thought. It's like the false attack. And then, you know, she she shoots the thing with the harpoon or whatever it is, and it goes out, you know, it goes out the door. Right? Oh, thank God, I finally won. Finally won. Well, no, not not really. <laughs> because he starts pulling on the cable and he's going to go through the exhaust fumes to get to her that way. I mean, it just doesn't stop. Now, eventually, of course, she wins. But that is an example of, if I've ever seen it, of having your cake and eating it, eating it too. Hitting all the beats, doing all the great techniques of horror, but the surprise every time is still there. And the one benefit is, yeah, this is time one of the few times where the monster doesn't win, the the hero wins. And I think that combination is one of the reasons why that was massively, that film was massively popular. Mm -hmm. um, well, and, uh, it's funny too, you know, you're talking about this monster and alien, which is this horrible looking thing that is about as inhuman as you could get. And yet deeply intelligent, like in the way that great horror monsters often are, as, as we discussed earlier, like this thing is crafty. It's relentless. I mean, yes. it's a killing, it's a killing machine. Like yep. don't, you know, no doubt about it, but it has its own kind of advanced intelligence. And along those same lines, I think of, uh, Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. He's a great horror monster. Like he's almost got like a supernatural level of intelligence. Like somebody yeah. walks in the room, he knows what perfume she's wearing and like what her childhood was like. Yeah. You know? Well, it's, it's interesting you 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 would hit on that story example because that's a thriller, but a thriller is a combination. It is it is itself a mixed genre between detective and horror story, mm. and depending on how the writer handles it it will either lean more toward horror like Silence of the Lambs and Seven, or it'll lean more toward detective. But yes, he is a classic textbook example of a horror monster. So one of the joys of watching a horror movie well done or reading a horror novel well told has to do with watching the hero in this mental battle of wits with the monster. And as you say, like the stakes just keep ratcheting up. You know, you have Ripley trying to get away from this monster and then she goes into the pod and the monster's in the pod and then she shoots it with the harpoon and then it's coming through the, you know, it requires like a great horror monster requires the hero to be increasingly smart and resourceful yeah. and to keep coming up with solutions on the fly. And that's one of the great, pleasures of these kinds of stories and, and that's what we were talking about earlier about you know how that's all plot 
that's all plot. It's how you take what is the one of the weakest plot forms of all genres and you make it great. And it's and 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 it's right there. It's you have an extremely intelligent and crafty monster, which forces the hero to get progressively smarter and craftier herself. And the joy of watching that isn't just that she defeats the monster. It's how she does it. You know, she outthinks it. And, you know, because she's she's physically not the strongest person on that crew. But she's the smartest and she is not a passive victim. All of these things have to do with coming up with kicking that genre, that form up to a great story, not just an example of the form. So I want to talk about another beat, and it has to do with the way that the monster in horror uh, novels and horror films can often be representative of the other, like in extremis. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and, and in our fear of the other, that's what the horror monster often is working on yes. in its, uh, viewers or in its readers. Well, the, the opponent in any story is the other. And what horror is really great at is taking the fear of the other and taking it to its logical extreme, which is. The other, which we, we fear, we fear, we fear the other from birth. The other is the first opponent from birth in the story of our life. And so what horror has done is it said, I'm going to create this. I'm going to symbolize it. I'm going to give it as much symbolic power as I possibly can by making it the other that is not only I, I, I really don't want them living in my neighborhood. It's the other is horrifying. It's inhuman. And this is why transcendent horror always deals with the, the monster as other in the extreme. It's, it is the other that we are so afraid of that we consider them less than human. And this is, you know, this is, of course, once again, you go back to the essential one that, that defined the form, you go back to Frankenstein, that's what, that's what that character is, you know, um, and it's, Frankenstein is not about creating life, it's creating a human being. And this is a human being who is, when he's brought to life, he is shunned, he's driven away, he is in exile. And he's devastated. He cannot become part of the human community because he is so horrifying to look at. And this is why Get Out used that same concept, but made it, and, and why it has so much deep power in that story is because the ghost in that story is America's ghost. It's slavery, right? This is the the sin from the past that has never been paid for truly and has always defined this country and is and to this day is part of our constitution and the and and it and it takes the ghost the crimes of what a black young male has to deal with in right and so he's He's and and you get that that great beat at the end when he's fighting with the girl at the end and the cop car comes up and we think oh god yeah he's he's, he's screwed now he's <laughs> he's really we all know what the, what the, what it's like we know right. what the truth is and and of course then they flip that beat but and then of course you get the 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 whole con the concept of get out which is that you know this quote liberal guy who loves Obama. Um, <laughs> Uh, he's created a modern plantation. I mean, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. But that's what I mean about in terms of taking the concept of, in horror, of the the monster as other in the extreme and giving it tremendous thematic power that is much greater than you get with the normal monster. Hmm. 
So, and you know, it's like, this is a perfect time to segue to this because I think the, the character in Get Out, if I'm recalling correctly, who shows up in the cop car is the rational skeptic, yeah. which is another beat. It's yeah. the ally or the rational skeptic. This is maybe one of the, I don't know. I love this beat in horror, in horror films and in horror stories where you have this friend essentially who's yeah. functioning as a surrogate for the audience and kind of helping to bring them along. So what is the rational skeptic? Let's, let's tease it out. Well, you have to have somebody to take the stink off the horror form. And what do I mean by that? And, you know, take the stink off is, is a term that's normally used in detective stories to take the stink off of a character as a possible suspect. Oh, they're not a possible suspect. Well, guess what? They're, they're, they're probably the guy that did it, you know, but you want to tell the audience they couldn't have done it. So when we find out they did do it, it's a huge surprise. So we actively as writer take the stink off that character. So in, in the case of the horror story itself, we're talking about the supernatural. And so in our normal day-to-day -day life, we're not dealing with the supernatural, right? We are dealing with rational mind of <clears throat> got to do my job, got to live my life and so on and so forth. And so how do we get the audience into this world, not only visually, but in our mindset, how do we get them into that haunted house, into that world of fear? And so what you do is you come up with this character who is typically an ally who is there to give you a rational expl explanation of what the phenomena that the hero has just experienced. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, maybe it's a monster, but come on. It's not a monster. It could be this, you know, it, it maybe just, it was just a figment of your imagination or you were dreaming or, and typically in, in like in Dracula and so on, they, they actually bring in a doctor or a, or a scientist who, who says, oh, who, who actually has a scientific expl explanation of how uh, a vampire is actually possible, right? This is, you know, he's, he's this old Freudian looking guy. Right. So, well, he must be telling the truth, you know, this this old doctor guy. Um, but but it then allows us to say. Well, yeah, that could be the explanation, but I'm, I know what I saw and I know what I'm experiencing. And so it makes it 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 gives the audience a chance to to go along with the ride. And that's what it's there for. You don't really need it, but it sure helps if you have it. I think too, like it, it seems like anyway, I mean, as, assuming I have this correct, that this, I haven't seen Get Out in a, in a minute, but I feel like that character, that friend character is kind of there for comic relief too. And it can be oh, a yeah. fun, it can be like a fun pressure release for the audience to have that person being like, I don't know, man. <laughs> you know, like, exactly right. And yeah. that's why, that's why you, Sometimes, not always, but sometimes you will get comic elements that you that the writer infuses into the story because it's again, it's a way of it's also a way of relieving the pressure. It's like the false attack. We calm down, we relieve the pressure. Oh, you know, everything's going to be OK. And now when the attack does come, whoa, it's even more surprising and, and, and scary. Right, right, right. So. There's also a story beat uh, in horror in horror stories about crossing the barrier uh, to the forbidden, and I think an example that you use, like just a prime example, is King Kong, yeah. where at some point there is the monster, there's some sort of barrier or wall that's keeping that monster from the human community, and that barrier inevitably gets breached. Yeah, and that can come in lots of different forms, but that would be like maybe a just an easy example. Yeah, it, it's it's typically a gate. It's some kind of an opening. And in King Kong, of course, it is a big, you know, the, the, it's a huge wall uh, it, it, with these these this fortress gate that has been 
you know, has, has bars across it um, because King Kong is massive. You know, he's incredibly dangerous. And we're able to keep that difference. He is in the prehistoric world. He's in the, in, in this world of horrific world, state of nature. We are on the other side of that gate. We are in civilization. And this is the physical manifestation of the basic distinction or horror between human and inhuman. The horror comes when the inhuman enters the human community. And so th where it is most powerful is when the hero opens the gate themselves. I, I'm, think I'm thinking again of Ex Machina, <laughs> yeah. you know. That's where she's in that glass. She's in the glass box. And when she leaves the glass box, it's trouble. <laughs> yep, exactly. Once you mix that, then, and of course, conceptually, you're mix, you were, that's when you're getting the audience to realize, well, wait a minute, my old distinction between what is human versus inhuman, maybe I, maybe I had it wrong. But whatever it is, once that, once that monster comes through that gate, uh, you got big trouble. And um, the and typically that's where the heroes internal move toward the the, the fractured mind, the destroyed mind speeds up. It, that's that where you hit the slippery slope. And it's also, I think, tied to like this idea of the monster breaching the wall is tied to the story beat that you lay out about uh, the safe haven and how especially when it comes to the ultimate battle or the final conflict in a horror story, it's, it's really effective to have that take place in a location that is otherwise thought of as safe. You know, it's the ultimate violation. And I, I think too, like I'm trying to think of any examples that come to mind, but it doesn't necessarily have to be just the final battle. You know, it could be something that escalates towards the final battle where, where the monster kind of comes to town and starts to cause trouble in a place that was otherwise just fine. Pre right. Know, and, and a lot of times it is, it is, for example, in, uh, in something like nightmare on Elm street, it's, it is the barriers inside it's in the mind itself. Um, it, you know, they come through a dream, for example. Um, and, and, you know, of course the problem is you got to sleep at some point. You, you can try to stay awake as long as you want, but as soon as you fall asleep, that gate is going to, is going to open and you can't stop it. And it's in your own head. So yeah, it, it's, it's what really triggers. It's really what escalates the, the, the conflict between the monster and the hero. And once that happens, it's pretty much, you can't go back. It's over. Uh, you know, the, you have, once you cross that barrier, it's, it's, it's again, in a larger thematic sense, once you cross that barrier to try to defeat death, you will only make it worse. You will only make the, the destructiveness of death even greater. You think, you think that's how you're going to, how you're going to stop it or postpone it. In fact, you've done just the reverse. So there is another beat. It's the double ending. We've already kind of talked about it. I think it's the one, one of the beats that I think anybody who's watched a horror film understands. It's the one where the, the monster comes back to life yeah. uh, and returns even after you think the monster is dead. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip forward and I want to talk about transcending the horror story, which you've touched on already, but I think it's such an important point that you uh, that you lay out in this section of the book, and it's critical, you know, for people listening. Nobody wants to write a mediocre story, right? Yeah. You don't want to work in a genre just to do it and just to hit certain beats and kind of perform as a functionary. You want to transcend the genre that you're writing in, and there are two main ways to transcend the horror form. And I'd like to discuss those before we part company. Uh, the first is to uh, combine horror and myth uh, in a religious sense. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. And the combination of horror and myth is one in which 
again, I, I don't want to spend too much time on the myth form, although it is the oldest form. Um, but myth gives us the longest track for growth. It is essentially covering the lifespan. And when you combine it with horror, your basic and, and the basic theme of myth is immortality. Is how can we be immortal? And the myth says that you become immortal by discovering your destiny, discovering what you were born to do. Now, when you combine that with horror, what you're basically saying is the way you can become immortal is by getting to the afterlife, by getting, by getting to a heaven and avoiding hell. And th th this meaning that, once again, R says you can't beat death. Father time is undefeated. But what by combining with myth, it's saying that I will give you immortality in the next life. And that what that means then, and this is why all the great religions are basically moral codes, is that the, this is how you must act in this life in order to get that heavenly reward. And if you act that way, in other words, if, if you don't act that way, then you will have eternal damnation and eternal hell. And so that, that is the hard part, the, the, the reward versus the punishment. That's the hard part that is attached to the myth part, which is the journey into immortality. And that's yeah. why the, it's such a powerful combination. It's why all the religious stories are among the most powerful stories in history. And I go into, the, in the book, I talk about the, the story beats of Christianity and why it is and why it works the way it does. I talk about, you know, the, the, the most important story of Christianity since the Christ story itself, uh, which is Charles Dickens' um, Christmas Carol. Uh, it, it, one of the most influential uh, stories ever written and an entire TV network worth billions of dollars, Hallmark, is based on that one story. Everything they do is basically that story. Um, and then the other way that you transcend, that you can transcend horror by combining with another genre is the horror science fiction epic. And there it's basically what you're doing is, as we, we discussed earlier, you're taking the, the basic concepts of horror and how to defeat death and how to, whether we can overcome the flaws of the mind and you're taking it to the level of an entire species. And so this is this is a story form about which again Frankenstein is the the main example of it, which is you know when you create can you create a higher form of humanity than human beings currently are, so that we can avoid destroying ourselves and destroying the planet. And then there's also. Uh, like you talk about the four types of horror sci-fi epics. There's the one that you just described with Frankenstein where you're recreating a human being. There's another kind where you're creating a human from an animal. And I think Rise of the Planet of the Apes yeah. is the example. There's creating a human from a machine, which is Ex Machina. And then there's creating a higher human or an entirely new species. And I think the example you gave there is Westworld. Yeah, which was one. Yeah, which is, uh, I love that. I love that first season, especially of Westworld. Yeah, yeah. first season is as good a season of TV as you will ever see. Yeah. Unfortunately, because of the ambition that they're doing, which is, you know, how do you create a higher form than the human race? Uh, good luck with that. You know, if you can come up with that, you're one of the greatest philosophers in the history of the world. They weren't able to do, they weren't able to continue it in, in, in subsequent um, seasons, in my opinion. But that first season, it, as great as it gets, mm -hmm. just fantastic. And if you want to see how, if you want to take on that challenge as a writer, uh, the ambitious, most ambitious story you could probably take on, definitely study first season of Westworld because they got pretty damn close. 
Well, I learned a ton from reading all about horror in this book of yours and have enjoyed this conversation. I should say to listeners that we didn't get to every single thing. There's a lot in this book. As you said earlier, it's a long book. You are comprehensive in your approach and it's a really rich resource. And it's not just about horror. It's about all the main genres, like you're covering the whole thing. So I appreciate the time and, uh, you know, your willingness to answer all these questions and kind of go over it for my listeners. And I, I always ask my guests if they have anything in the works. You've written The Anatomy of Story, The Anatomy of Genre. Is there anything else that you're working on? Uh, I am working on a project which is, well, I'll probably do at the end of the year, which is I'm taking the wisdom of the genres, these different life philosophies that each genre expresses and expresses in dramatic ways. So it makes it more powerful to the, the reader. And I'm trying to see how we can take the wisdom of these story forms and apply it to our lives. So it's something I'm very excited about. I the the biggest revelation I had in writing the anatomy of genres was that if you sequence the genres in a certain way, beginning with horror as the pr most primal genre, you get a ladder of enlightenment. And that as as human beings, as individuals, we need to go through every one of those genres, learn the great wisdom that each one has. And it's only when we've got the wisdom from all of them that we really have a chance to have to live the best life we can live. So it's something I'm very, very excited about. And uh, having written the anatomy of genres is really what made it possible for me because I didn't know any of that before I started. Hmm. Well, I, then I have to ask, if, if horror is the most primal, what's the highest rung on the ladder, genre-wise? Love story. The love story. The okay. last two, the, the, the first two are, are horror followed by action. The last three are fantasy, which is about how to live. Then detective, which is about the mind and the truth. And love story, which is, is the genre that gives us the recipe for happiness all right well i'm hooked i, I look forward to it <laughs> and uh, i really appreciate the time and i wish you well on all that you have going thank you so much it's been it's been such a joy to be here with you and talk story with you i'd, I'd be happy to do it anytime <laughs>